Good evening. Oh, that was kind of weak. Good evening. Welcome again to the Lift Every Voice lecture series. Uh, I'm Bishop Talbert Swan II, um, and I want to thank you all for being here on tonight in our 13th uh, annual series. And it's, it's really a miracle that we made it to 13, because I was going to stop after 10, somewhere around there. And um, with a little nudging and encouragement from Anna Marie, uh, we kept going um, during the pandemic. And here we are on the other side of the pandemic. Um, there are others that I'm sure will be here. Um, and I noticed the audience, um, there's a such thing as CP time, um, and the audience definitely reflects that. But we start on time. My bishop used to say, start on time, end on time, and in between, have a good time. And so we're here tonight to have a good time. So <clears throat> I traditionally do this uh, just to kind of break the ice and ask you to kind of get up and um, go shake hands, uh, fist bump, high five, or speak to somebody you did not come here with or who you may not know to introduce yourself, say hello, hi, um, give them some money, uh, exchange phone numbers or whatever. Now, y'all should be up by now. <laughs> y'all should be up by now, moving about the crowd. You're free to move about the country. Uh, yes, yes. All right, thank you so much, thank you so much. Um, we could not do this without our sponsors, um, and so we want to take some time and acknowledge and thank those um, who continue to help us uh, bring in um, some of the um, movers and shakers from around the country who have excelled in certain fields of endeavor and who grace us in Springfield every year um, during the course of this Lift Every Voice lecture series. And so we want to thank uh, Bay State Health, who uh, has been with us all 13 years of this lecture series. As a matter of fact, yeah, you can clap right there if you want to. Uh, the first year I envisioned it, um, uh, I called Steve Bradley, and he said, well, uh, send me a budget. And I sent him the budget, and he said, okay, we'll pay the whole budget. And, um, and they've been on board ever since. And so one more time for Bay State Health. Uh, we want to acknowledge the Irene and George Davis Foundation, um, Health New England, who is here tonight as well. Mass Mutual um, and MGM Springfield. Um, thank, thankful for each and every one of our sponsors. And on that note, we want to give you a note from one of our sponsors. At Bay State Health, we are compelled to be a force for good. That compassionate, spirited, and steadfast drive has helped us be the difference for you and so many others within our diverse human family. Every day, in ways big and small, we are humbled and privileged that our impactful care helps you go on to make all the difference in your own world. Together, we have the capacity to transform lives. All right, one more time for our sponsors. Come on, come on. All right. Uh, each year, we invite people to come in and host each night of the lecture series, those who are active in our community. Um, tonight, our host is no stranger. Uh, she is on our planning committee and has hosted many, many times throughout the years. Uh, Waleska Lugo de Jesus is the CEO of Inclusive Strategies, founding director of the Healing Racism Institute, 
um, and she's widely recognized for her advocacy for anti-racism work in identifying educational strategies to create equity. Uh, she has many years of experience uh, working in the private uh, nonprofit sector, higher education, and within healthcare systems, widely respected. She is a commissioner of the Massachusetts Art and Cultural Council, um, and she does so much throughout our community uh, with many different organizations. She is my sister in the struggle for justice, and I'm glad that she is here on tonight uh, to lead us further in um, tonight's program. And so would you receive tonight our host, Waleska Lugo de Jesus. Thank you, Bishop Swan, First Lady Swan, community members, and the planning committee. Welcome to the 13th annual Lift Every Voice Lecture Series 2023. The theme this year is learning from the past, looking toward the future. As I hear uh, Bishop Swan, I'm reflecting, I might have been a part of this event for about 10 years, and it's one of my favorite in the community because it does just that, uh, lift us up. And we have the opportunity to not only hear from national speakers, um, but also celebrate community advocates and, um, and be in community with you. So thank you for making time and making space for joining us today. I want to invite you to um, sing with us the uh, Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice. At the turn of the 20th century, the lyrics eloquently captured the solemn yet hopeful appear for the liberty of black Americans. Set against the religious invocation of God and the promise of freedom, this song was a later adopted by the NAACP and prominently used as a rallying cry during the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s. Please join us in song, Lift Every Voice.
Thank you for joining in song. Now I'd like to um, welcome our musical guest, T. Swan, if you can start making your way um, over to the podium. Uh, T. Swan sings melodious music and asks why. Why do we have to keep working harder just to catch up? Why do systems oppress us? Why is Black Lives Matter offensive? Why are black people seen as a threat? And so much more in his re revolutionary lyrics. Any resemblance to Bishop Swan and First Lady Swan is accurate. <laughs> Please welcome musical guest, T. Swan. What's going on, guys? As she said, my name is T. Swan. That's my mom. My father is Bishop Swan, obviously. Most of you guys know who I am, so... I'm gonna do a couple songs for y'all. She was up here quoting my lyrics, I like that. <laughs> this, 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 this song I'm about to do is called Respect. I ain't never been one for flexing. Gold ring, gold watch, gold necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. Clap. I would never been one for flexing. Go ring, go watch, go necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. Voice for the young males, here's the message. But putting songs out since 2011. I know people who be lying on their records. I don't think that I could ever be that desperate. I still never owned an expensive necklace. But I know my whole mind is a gold mine. I still never got shift. But the voices in my head are telling me that it's showtime. Never got to have a chef in the crib, but everybody in my team brings something to the table. I may not have a band to spin, but musically, me and my dogs will kill it on stage, though. Hey, I ain't never been one for flexing. Gold ring, gold watch, gold necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. I ain't never been one for flexing. Gold ring, gold watch, gold necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. Never want no true religion, but I got good genes. I'm not a baller yet, but still I got a good team. I never wore a grill, but what's coming out my mouth is worth platinum. Barely getting booked, but it's only the first chapter. I got the dopest lines, but I don't be holding weight. A buying Gucci belts, letting my money go to waste. I got all this drive, but I never rode a wraith. I never caught no ball, man, but I never dropped a ball, man. I never signed to a major, but you know the deal. I just want people to label me as so for real. I never took a man's life, but you're right. If you say that I should be on death row for every flow I kill, I never been one for flexing. And go ring, go watch, go necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. I ain't never been one for flexing. Go ring, go watch, go necklace. If it came down to it, no question. I would rather be well respected. Yeah. Thank you, T. Swan. I did steal his lyrics um, for the introduction uh, because I remember uh, in previous years uh, hearing it and just wanting to bring forth some very important points in it. So thank you, uh, T. Swan. Uh, another round of applause for him, please. All right, um, so Spring of Hope Church is our place of worship, tells our stories, and helps our community. So please join Bishop Swan um, in this next section of Period of Sharing. Bishop? Y'all give me a hand. Yeah. Oh, my wife has showed up. <laughs> give my wife a hand. <laughs> So this is an interesting day. Um, our speaker, um, first leg of his flight was delayed um, and out of Richmond, and he was actually in the air when his second leg took off from LaGuardia. Um, so he rushed to uh, rent a car uh, to drive here from New York and should arrive uh, safely. Uh, very soon. 
uh, which means I want y'all to be real receptive tonight because he's been through a lot just to get here on tonight. Um, but this is the time that we uh, take uh, to um, just share, and um, we ask that you would share a gift um, with the church. As a matter of fact, uh, I just don't believe, I believe it's a sin um, if you come to church and we don't take an offering. Y'all real quiet tonight. Y'all y'all much quieter than my Sunday morning crowd. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to ask that you would share. Those who can share, $20 seed. But whatever the best gift you have, I'm going to ask uh, if Minister Tina or someone would prepare to come and receive the gift uh, from you. And we don't ask you to walk. Um, um, what we ask you to do is just to pass your gift to the end of the row that you're on. Um, and if you're on a row with multiple people, um, just watch your money until it makes its way into the pan. Um, I'm not saying anybody's going to steal in church, but they just might forget um, to put it in the pan. And so uh, we would ask that you would um, do that now just to the end of the row and she'll come right down the middle of the row and she'll receive um, from each and every one of you. And while you're giving, while you're giving, um, uh, it's been a while since we've been in person. Uh, and so I haven't got to tell my joke about the $20 bill and the $1 bill in several years. You can go ahead and start receiving, sis. Um, Cash App, if you want to give by Cash App, the cash tag is dollar sign spring of hope. Dollar sign spring of hope. Uh, so one dollar bill uh, ran into a twenty dollar bill and um, hadn't seen each other in a long time. And um, one dollar bill said, twenty dollar bill, you're looking good, looking fit and trim and look like you're happy. Uh, where you been? He said, well, man, I've been everywhere. I've been to the casino. Uh, I've been out uh, on vacation. I've been to the best clubs, to the plays, to the uh, comedy clubs. Man, I've been just about everywhere you can think of. So you're not looking too bad yourself, one dollar bill. Uh, tell me what you've been up to these days. He said, oh man, I've been at the same place, at church. Yeah, y'all didn't, y'all didn't laugh. <laughs> All right, y'all didn't catch it. Y'all didn't catch it. Church folk would catch that immediately. Uh, but thank you so much for your time of giving and your time of sharing with us on tonight. It is much appreciated um, um, to help us to continue the ministry that we do here at Spring of Hope. Back in the hands of Waleska, since y'all don't want to laugh at my jokes. Huh? I'm getting instructed by my wife, and brothers know what that means. Um, so again, if you want to give by Cash App, it's dollar sign Spring of Hope. You can give by GiveLify, and by PayPal, you can go to our website, 413hope.org, and click the online giving link, and you can give through that method as well. Thank you, Bishop Swan. Sis, I have a donation here also, because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm excited to know that we can uh, make a donation and share the uh, in this period of sharing also by cash up, because I've been at the end of the road with no cash and have to borrow in church. So amen to that. Um, now we'd like to invite our uh, dance presentation to come forth and please help us welcome, her name is K.O. and the dance instructor is Genevia. I also want to introduce her. Youthful es Expressions creates a positive, energetic, and structural environment for dancers of all ages and levels. They make all kids feel welcome and inspired. The instructors provide a solid foundational training to help students grow both mentally and physically. 
Dancers are taught to use creative expression to be unapologetically their authentic selves. So this is one of the reasons why Lift Every Voice is one of my favorite events. Every year we get to enjoy music, we get to listen to spoken word, and we get to visually enjoy artistic youth. One more round of applause for youthful expressions. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> Youthful expressions. All right, I heard our guest, there you are. Um, our next part is the spoken word and uh, joining us will be Lynette Johnson. Sister Lynette Johnson is an artist that composes powerful, creative poetry and spoken word. During the day, actually just an hour ago, I get to enjoy opportunities to co-facilitate with her uh, for Bay State Health. And, um, and then an evening like this, uh, and that's her superpower, and she is a senior specialist, learning development leader for talent management at Bay State Health. In her artistry as a creative, she builds relationships, mentors, and creates opportunities to help others grow. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Lynette Johnson.
Good evening. So this is a black history poem. I called it black history. It's kind of obvious. That's, that's what we did. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here. Black History Month is when we traditionally recite an exhaustive list of names of black contributors, ancestral and present, known and forgotten, people who made the world better, easier, filled us with hope, scientists and shaman, farmers and inventors, politicians and artists, educators and mathematicians, martyrs and warriors who would never live long enough to revel in the spoils of their battle. Sometimes we will flash grainy black and white photos and film footage of civil rights activists, of civil rights activists, and we will all pretend that was a lifetime ago, that society has evolved significantly since all that ugly stuff. Then someone would provide a righteous quote that would make everyone feel they were seated on the right side of history they would be proud to acknowledge in the future. We all pause to marvel at their grace and ingenuity, the builders, doers of the impossible, the necessarians. I made up that word, but it works, right? <laughs> They gifted us their genius, took divinely guided and measured risks, stood for something, sat for something, kneeled for something, died for something, pushed against barriers, disrupted and dismantled, climbed walls they couldn't burn down, reminded the world of all the stuff we been knew, what black folks been knew, brilliance and bravery and passion and innovation ain't a rare occurrence in black people, matter of fact, it's pretty much a requirement. If you plan to exist and be black at the same time, you gonna need some audacity. You gonna need some humor, some skepticism, and some spice. How in the world could you explain a people who've been told every feature on their face was hideous, smiling with delight at their own reflection? How else can we account for all the somethings made of nothing? The connection to worship and ritual that was interrupted, stolen, buried, and demonized, and yet still remains. Pulitzer Prize winning authors whose grandparents were not permitted to learn to read. Scholarship and achievement in institutions where we were initially only allowed in to clean or to serve. Healing others in spaces where we might have been turned away to perish upholding laws written before we were factored as full-fledged human beings, explain the recipes, the dance, the English language bent, not broken, reformed with rules and parameters still valid, effective, legitimate, and borrowed by everyone. How could you explain the way we recognize each other? Greet strangers with familiarity, see hints of family in shared features, the way we continue to lend and build and enlist, invest, risk life and limb, the way we too sing America, the way we too pledge allegiance, the way we too protect and serve. We lift every voice and believe deep in our hearts that the not so distant future holds a space for us to study and salute and examine the past accurately and critically, the lows as well as the highs. It is patriotic to participate in the celebration of all Americans, is it not? We are the spice, the electricity, the richness in the soil, the fragrance in the wind. We had a little something to do with everything. Black history is American history. It is world history. It is present and it is future. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lynette Johnson. Uh, beautiful words. As a reminder for all of our guests that are joining us through social media, um, Please use the hashtag LEV2023, hashtag 413 Hope. And I want to re acknowledge our sponsors uh, Bay State Health, Health New England, Mass Mutual, the Davis Foundation, MGM. I also want to acknowledge our media host, Focus Springfield. Uh, please thank Brendan for being with us. And it feels like every community event. And don't forget to support your Focus Springfield Community TV. That's my announcement for today. 
Uh, I want to uh, bring back uh, T. Swan for our second music selection. Oh, you guys clap for me. I like that. I like that. All right, so I'm going to do another song. This one's called Cloud Nine. It's about that feeling that you just feeling on Cloud Nine, you know? That's not it. <laughs> Uh, he, 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 I think he know that's not it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Clap. Yo, sky is the limit. Flying up in it. My mind is running a gold mile a minute. Minding my business. Trying to get it. I can't wait to say that I finally did it. Diamonds and riches, y'all be lying to get it. I ain't a gimmick, I'm so authentic. I've been committed, trying to get it. Sky is the limit, flying up in it. Cloud nine, can't believe I'm 28 now, it's about time. People wanna ask why I'm always chilling inside. A lot of y'all energy, it be killing my vibe. And I would much rather be feeling alive. Never touched a meal, but wrote about a million lines. They be telling y'all the silliest lies. I be telling y'all what been on my mind. But I'm still on the grind, yeah, the sky is the limit, flying up in it. My mind is running a gold mile a minute, minding my business, trying to get it. I can't wait to say that I finally did it. Diamonds and riches, y'all be lying to get it. I ain't a gimmick, I'm so authentic. I've been committed, time to get with it. The sky is the limit, flying up in it. I'm about to take off and take flight. And lately it's been no days off and late nights. I got more brave. I used to have stage fright. I'm skybound now. I used to be afraid of heights. I'm looking at the game through a bird's eye view. I'm getting better every song and every verse I do. Taking the high road, I hope it lead to success. I'm spreading my wings and I'm leaving my chest. I got so many things that be on my chest. This be relieving my stress. I'm just a human being, but I plan on being the best. Sky is the limit. I picture me on a jet. I need to get me some Franklins, and I still need some respect. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's just me. I'm going to be a household name. You could trust me. It was only in my own brain I was stuck there. Even when it pours down rain, I'll be up there in the sky. Watch me fly so high. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank you again, T. Swan. Uh, thank you, everyone. I want to acknowledge and welcome that Dr. Bellamy is here with us. We're going to give him a minute to catch his breath. And I want to re-invite um, Sister Lynette Johnson for another spoken word. Yeah. All right. So I got another poem. All right. And this poem, in order to appreciate this poem, you have to either have to be black or appreciate black people. So are we good? Yeah. Yes. All right, wonderful. <laughs> so we were recently serving as a host family for some extra, it's a true story, it's not really true, it's a poem. Anyway, I'll do that. So we're recently serving as a host family for some extraterrestrials vacationing from a far off galaxy. They told me the atmosphere in the Milky Way really messes with their vision, so they're unable to make the distinction, the various shades of human skin, so basically these are some legit colorblind aliens. They had such a good time, they wanted to be sure the next time they came back, they found them some more. People like me, without being able to see, they need to know how to recognize a Negro, for show. First of all, we may be older than we look. Literature and language and music on lock, we are simultaneously hated and emulated. We will flip a venomous slur into a term of endearment. Now everybody wants to be able to use the N-word, that's crazy. 
We make prison and poverty look a little bit sexy. Some folks turn lemons into lemonade, child's play. Please, we take junk like pig entrails and transform them into culinary delicacies, chitlins. We don't waste nothing except money occasionally. We are legendary Maya Angelou, Amiri Baraka, Nelson Mandela. We rest in peace and power and poetry. But while we live in, we amazing, we loud and mean bad. By the way, where's our reparations and their repercussions? We don't wait until the movie is over to begin our discussions. We will warn the protagonists of impending doom. Wrong girl, get out the room. We are chicken wings and malt liquor, brothers and sisters in cotillion and Creole tent revival and step show, we mourn heavy, fall out on caskets heavy, why Lord take me? <laughs> we are quotable, who gonna check me boo? We got Tuskegee and Morgan and Asada and Sojourner and Pac, we got sweet potato pie and thank you Jesus, we work hard, we invented innovation, pyramids, cornrows, cotton gins and double dutch, we have right jabs and jump shots, we have left hooks and deferred dreams and we'll cuss you out and pray for you, that is black. We nappy, we happy, we ashy, we greasy, we got heart disease and diabetes and big behinds naturally. Freedom fighters, running backs, presidents, welterweight champs, half the people we call auntie ain't even related, but they family that's black. We beat our kids. <laughs> we will beat your kids. <laughs> We got style, fibroids, sickle cell, Heineken, Newports, that's ours. Afros, crown royal bags, jumping brooms, electric slide, that's ours. Twerk stars, poverty, hip hop, Barack, Michael Jackson, Prince, and LeBron. We got Rick James. You know what? We got Tina Marie, too. I don't care. She was light skinned. <laughs> we got Assalamu alaikum and old time religion. We got double meaning for the word kitchen. <laughs> we need to know who made the potato salad. Seriously, we need to know who made the potato salad. It's just, it's a thing. I'm sorry. Um, we know one good church service got more healing than a year therapy. We know if someone says, I love hop, oh God knows I do. And somebody will say it before the year is through. We know what line comes next. We've read the autobiography of Malcolm X a minimum of three times. Some of our brothers deserve gold medals and pickup lines, and we have an understanding. We are fluent in nonverbal communication. We wish somebody would without saying a single word. We got good skin, um, roots in both hemispheres, good skin, flesh like bronze and steel. Sometimes we be so black and so slick, they mistake our skin for emotional Teflon, like pain ain't gonna stick. We are generations of oppression tangled in a netting of we shall overcome someday. We, carriers of the survivor gene, Royer, royalty and warriors make up the knotty mahogany branches of our family tree. You'll know you come up on a member of my team by our greeting, a head nod, a warm hug, the secret handshake or a raised fist or the faintest scent of incense, Murray's hair grease or honey buttered biscuits, but you could close all your eyes and see all this because being black ain't really a color as much as it is an experience. Thank you. I told you she was powerful and creative. Thank you, Lynette Johnson. All right, we have come to this important part of the program where uh, Bishop Swan is making his way to the stage to formally introduce Dr. West Bellamy. Give me a hand. <laughs> All right. How about that, Lynette Johnson? How about that T. Swan and his, and his mama? <laughs> now you know what else is black? Trying to get to a Black History Month program when your plane is delayed <laughs> and you're in the air when your second leg takes off and you run and grab and rent a car and you drive all the way to Springfield in the rain just so that you can be here. That's what our speaker did on tonight. <laughs> Dr. Bellamy is the former vice mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia. He is the youngest individual ever elected to the post. He came to the national spotlight 
after he led the effort to remove the statues of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson from city parks. Yeah. Uh, what amazes me is those who don't want you to teach about what Confederate soldiers stood for in schools, but they want to keep Confederate statues up to preserve our history. Dr. Bellamy's primary focus is on improving the lives of those who lack resources and positive role models in their lives. He is the nonprofit founder, executive local activist, organizer, and civic leader. He received his doctoral degree at Virginia State University. Um, he sat on the city council. He is an author of a best-selling book. Um, he's appeared on CNN, NPR, uh, and many other news outlets has been featured in New York Times, Washington Post. Uh, other than that, he's an anointed and gifted, empowering and inspiring young man. Um, I didn't know he was as young as he is, um, but young man who is doing great things, um, both there educating our youth in Virginia and across this nation. Uh, it was my pleasure to invite him to be with us. I wish the place was full on tonight, um, especially when you bring this kind of talent uh, to Springfield. Um, but you all that are here are in for a treat on tonight uh, when you hear this gifted young man. Would you stand to your feet and put your hands together for everything he did to get here on tonight? I want you to give a big round of applause for Dr. West Bellamy. All right, good evening. good evening. All right. I want to make sure we're not sounding like we're at a funeral. This is a celebration. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. First and foremost, give an honor to God who's ahead of my life. Yes. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the honorable Brother Bishop Swan, who is, uh, yeah, let's give him a round of applause. I guess Brother's watching from the back. He's he like, all right, I got it. <laughs> But Bishop Swan, who is a thought leader across the globe, many of us from across the country um, love to not only listen to him, but learn from him. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here. I would also like to offer my condolences uh, to uh, Brother Swan II. And uh, my prayers and thoughts are with each of you and the church family, as well as his family. And also another round of applause for his son, T. Swan, because that was fire. And Ms. Johnson, Ms. Johnson, correct? Ms. Johnson, the poem was, was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you for the kind words. Let's give her another round of applause. Indeed, indeed. Bishop Swan told a, a, a little bit about what it took to be here. Um, yeah, we had a... We had a few travel complications, but what's most important is that we're here. And you know, I, I think it's one thing when we talk about the, the room should be packed, but I firmly believe that God has here who is supposed to be here. And who is supposed to hear this message will hear this message. So with that being said, let's get right into it. I like to begin every talk in which I give with some specific words from a person who I look up to. I think it's a person who many of us have heard before and his words go to a certain extent like this. Nobody else can do this for us. No Johnsonian civil rights bill can do this for us. No Lincolnian emancipation proclamation can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, then he or she must sign with the ink and pen of their own self-assertive manhood and their own Emancipation Proclamation. The speaker goes on to say, don't let anybody take your manhood or your womanhood for that matter. He goes on to talk about how some people told a lie one day, how they couched it in language, how they made every time you hear the word white something high and pure and clean. When you look at the word black, it's always something dirty and vile and degrading. But he wanted to ensure that he got the language right tonight. He wanted to get the language so right that everybody would yell out. And when they walked out of the church in which he was speaking from, they knew that, yes, they were black and they were proud of it and that we're black and they were beautiful. 
And those words are coming from the, one of the greatest orators of all time, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., words that led to the infamous song, Say It Loud. All right, now, I don't know. We ain't down south. That's what we, we, we got that down south when we say that. Now, let me hear you say, say it loud. Okay, that's a little bit better. That song, that infamous song, that, that song that many of our brothers and sisters, not only of yesteryear, but those of today, held so true and near and dear to their hearts, say it loud, I'm black and proud, was inspired by an individual who committed himself in his life and literally sacrificed his life to fighting white supremacy. So I wanted to take a little bit of time since I drove from LaGuardia to here in the snow. I haven't seen snow in some time. It's 80 degrees back down south where I left. I told my friends I left 80 degree weather this morning to go to 30, but it's well worth it because that's part of the sacrifice. And I want to be very clear, and I want to ask you all a question as we have this discussion. When we're talking about what it is that we must do for our communities, there's one question that comes to mind. What are you willing to sacrifice? Yeah. For some of us, that sacrifice means time. For others, that sacrifice is talent. For others, that sacrifice is challenge. All of us have an individual sacrifice, and I personally believe a purpose within your life that you have been designated and given to you by the Almighty, our Creator himself. But it's up to you to specifically carry out that purpose. But with such purpose comes sacrifice. When we're talking about one of the greatest ills of the world, not just of our nation, white supremacy, all of us have to be willing to sacrifice something. What's yours? You see, for me, that sacrifice was of all of the above. It was time, talent, it was treasure, it was sacrificing time with my family, it was sacrificing a job or two, it was people going to say negative things about me and my family, it was death threats, it was some other things that come along with it. It was people telling me that, Wes, you're really trying to take down a statue of the greatest person to ever walk this earth outside of the one who could walk on water. That's how they revered Robert E. Lee in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So you can imagine what comes along with an individual saying, no, 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 no. Those statues have to be removed. Those statues have to be gone. And I even did not fully understand the sacrifice that it would take. The sacrifice of people who you look up to. The sacrifice of people who you adore. The sacrifice of people who you love. The sacrifice of people who mentor you, telling you that you've lost your mind. The sacrifice of of people crushing your spirit in some regards of telling you or by telling you rather, you should probably leave alone alone. You should probably go on and do something else. You know, Wes, you've been working really well with those kids and those young people. Why don't you just keep doing that? Don't stir up any trouble. The sacrifice of your emotions, the sacrifice of feeling comfort, the sacrifice of security. While subsequently when we are going through this battle to remove these statues, individuals literally came after my livelihood. And my, my high, I was a high school teacher, and at the time, my high school superintendent said, you know, Wes, it's probably best if you just take some time away. Because these people have said that they're going to rally outside of our school every day in which you're here. So we got to figure something else. But God is faithful. Yeah. It's faithful beyond measure. There were some things that were going on along this fight of fighting white supremacy, specifically in Charlottesville, Virginia. Virginia, in which a place where many subscribe as the birthplace to a certain extent of this nation. One of the first colonies, Jamestown, Virginia, the place in which in 1619 it's been written, although I don't believe it true, that the first group of 20-some-odd Negroes came on the boat from what were stolen from Jamaica or even bought from Angola. Some of them dropped off in Jamaica the boat being stolen on the Atlantic Ocean, and then those Dutch pirates taking it to Virginia because they believed that they could trade those 20-some-odd Negroes for some supplies for them to get back to England. And these group of 20 Africans in this new land who were subsequently, who were subsequently placed in situations unlike anything they could have possibly imagined, having their front teeth knocked out and food force fed down their throats. 
the women being brutally raped, the men being castrated, the men not being able to protect their women, these, per these persons being in these outlandish conditions in which people literally looked at them as no more than cattle, their culture being stripped of them, their language being stripped of them, their religion in some regard being told that this was in fact wrong, their entire way of life being switched over. And subsequently, as those 20 some odd Negroes grew to more, and they realized that in this Commonwealth of Virginia, this place in which people said that, well, your religion is bad and we must keep you in bondage, specifically because you need to learn Christianity. And as our brothers and sisters said, well, we'll learn this Christianity as you know it, because make no mistake about it, Christianity was founded in Africa. It, it, was not a, it was not a white person's language that was just brought forth in Virginia or this Western civilized Christianity, but that's another conversation, Bishop. But this, this religion as you know it, Africans, are, is wrong. So as our brothers and sisters said, well, we will learn your religion and we will pray to the person in which you believe to be the divine leader of all. The rules were then reversed. And no, we can't keep you in bondage strictly based off of who you pray to. Now we must keep you in bondage because of what you look like. And as these brutal race masters, these brutal white treacherous men decided to continue to rape our sisters, initially it was fought in, in policy that the enslaved would take on the lineage and the uh, um, they, they, they would take on the, not only the last name, but the, the being of the father, meaning that if the father were to pass away, then that person would be set free. But these individuals who were in this colony of Virginia, who were in this town of Jamestown, and as what is now known as slavery began to spread out, decided that they had to change the rules through policy. We can't keep them in bondage based off of their religion. We can't allow them to be set free simply because of the lineage of the father. We just gonna simply keep them as slaved or enslaved because they're black. And that there in itself will be the determinant in terms of how long you stay in bondage, which will be forever. So as we're sitting, fast forward to 2017, as we're sitting in this land, on this, this stolen land, if I may be honest, as we're, as we're sitting on this land of the Mahokan tribe and this land in which these individuals, Thomas Jefferson, who was a treacherous slaveholder, not only just one of the quote unquote founders of education as some people like to tell it, which is false history if we wanna go down that path, but again, that's another story, Bishop, for another day. As we're sitting on this land in which these treacherous white supremacists have stolen these treacherous white supremacists in the year 1924 in which they erected a statue of Robert E. Lee with a Klan rally in which they dedicated this 58 foot statue in which they had the statue pointing at the historical black community known as Vinegar Hill to send a very clear message in 2017 as we're going through this fight that we must rid ourselves of overt white supremacy through forms of statues and the like, people had the nerve to say that I've lost my mind. But again, God is beyond faithful. And I want to, I want to inform you all, and, and you know, Bishop made the point in terms of he wished the room was packed, but I cannot get away from the point in which who is meant to be here is here. Because for you all specifically, the path, the vision, that thing, whatever it is that God has given to you is specifically for you. What was for me during that time period as the youngest elected official and so forth was I can see as clear as day these statues being removed. And it wasn't for everybody else to see. So while persons were again telling me that this is not the right way to go about it, this is not the right thing to do, let's just recontextualize these parks. Let's just think about a more easy and delicate way to address these issues. Let's figure out some of these other things that can distract us from addressing this issue or pretending as if we can't walk and chew gum simultaneously, i.e. we can't fight for affordable housing, fight for public education reform, fight for criminal justice reform, and remove statues simultaneously. While people were telling me that these things could not happen, I knew because God had told me 
that this wasn't for them to understand at this point. So when we come back, when we come back to present day 2023, the question then becomes to each and single one of you, what has he shown you? And what are you willing to sacrifice in order to be a drum major for justice? You see, when we, we talk about these terms, i.e. white supremacy, they can be seen as very blanket. We know the ills of overt white supremacy in which persons will call you the N-word or times in which we see an administration spend billions of dollars to send to people who look nothing like us, who don't even like those persons who are in this country, but yet still we can't figure out ways to feed the poor. We can't figure out ways to make college education free. We can't figure out ways to address some of the ills of our current society, but we can send money out. While some persons will say, well, that's blatant white supremacy. I won't disagree, but that is the policy structure and the governmental structure and the systemic structure in which this nation has been founded and currently exists. There are ways for us to be able to speak up and speak out about those atrocities, but there are also local atrocities right here in Springfield, Massachusetts that we can address. So then the question becomes again, what are you willing to sacrifice? Dr. King was very clear when he stated, nobody else can do this for us. Nobody, no Johnsonian civil rights bill of 1964 and so forth can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us because in fact, it's very well documented that Lincoln didn't even like black folk. In fact, prior to the quote unquote enslaved being free, Lincoln had a very small meeting of five brothers to come into his office with this newly founded chairman or cabinet leader of immigration with an E, not with an I, immigration meaning that these persons, these American citizens would be sent out. And Lincoln very clearly said to those five black men, what is it that you want? Because I see it very clearly, our two races cannot coexist in this nation. Lincoln went on to say that he has secured funding from Congress and so forth to send our brothers and sisters away. And those brothers and sisters came back and they were very clear that we built this nation. We built this nation, so we aren't going anywhere. Their sacrifice was to continue to stay here and fight for what they had built, not to go elsewhere, but to fight right here for what they have built. So now again, the question becomes, what are you willing to sacrifice? These ills of white supremacy, again, have been told throughout stories across the nation, across time. We see not only in present day, but in yesteryear and years past, story after story after story of white supremacists and white supremacy ideology remaining rampant and prevalent within our communities. But now the question becomes, how do we fight back? How do we fight back. Again, as Dr. King alluded to, nobody else can do this for us. So the question becomes, what are you willing to do? And then when we talk about what are those tangible strategies, I would dare ask you, when is the last time in which any of us have attended a local school board meeting? When is the last time in which any of us have sat in on a city council meeting? At what point do we decide to engage with our state legislators to let them know that the things in which we see in our communities that are blatant byproducts of white supremacy can be no more? Yes. It was by no mistake, nor was it not lost on me as I drove in here from New York, that as I got into the city of Springfield, I saw so many liquor stores lit up bright as you can find them. Now, as a, as a former elected official, I know very well in order to get certain stores, there are permits and policies that have to be passed, zoning regulations that have to be abided by in order for persons to be able to build such stores, tax breaks and abetments in some instances that individuals are allowed to be able to stay in business. And then I would ask the city of Springfield, which I don't know, but what commitment have they made to our people? What commitment, not only from a fiscal perspective, but from an educational perspective, from a reform perspective, have they made or are they making to our people? And if we, in this room specifically, are willing and daring, dare I say, to go and fight white supremacy, then we have to take the fight to the battlefield. And that battlefield is, in fact, in those local city council and school board offices. 
That is where the fight begins. Now, some of you may say, you know, I've done my fighting and I fought for 30 years. That was a fight for someone else now. I've done my part. But I would dare challenge you to say, when is this fight ever finished? 400 years plus in which black folk have been in this nation, as has been documented, although some will say that as early as 1589, there were a set of black folk here. But again, Bishop, that's for another story. But if they want to go with 1619, that makes 404 years in which black folk have been in this nation. And the question then becomes, what is it that we are willing to do to find a level battlefield? What is it that we are willing to do to provide our children who are coming behind us with a level playing field? Some may be cynical and say, well, that will never happen. Although I'm a dreamer and I believe that as sure as we keep fighting is as sure as the day in which we're going to see level playing fields because people told me very candidly, statues would never be removed. And I walked my daughter in a park with no statues in it two weeks ago. So when we talk about fighting white supremacy in this regard, I keep coming back to this question of what are you willing to sacrifice? And again, it's only a question in which you can answer on your own. What my plight is, is my plight. What God has given you in terms of your vision is for you. But all of us have an obligation and a duty and furthermore a responsibility to do something. To do something. Well, some of us will say, well, you know, uh, Dr. West or, or West or crazy man with this pink tie. It, it, it's not for me to go down to that city council office. It's not for me to go down to that local school board. And I'll say, okay. But how are you engaging with that young lady who may have a different color hairstyle and thinks every season is a hot girl summer who may have three, four children at the age of 21 and may need a little bit of assistance? Are you willing to engage with her? Are you willing to engage with that young man who may wear his pants a, a little lower than for your liking, who may use choice words every now and again, who may need a little bit more guidance? Are you willing to engage with him? If we are not willing to go down to the city hall and we're not willing to go down to the school board office, we have to be willing to be engaged within our communities when we see right, when we see wrong, when we see indifferent. We have to be engaged. You see, engagement with our folk, not being afraid of our own people, is also how we fight white supremacy. The sacrifice of getting out of your comfort level to say, young brother, I see you and I'm willing to help you, is also how we fight white supremacy. Fighting back the urge and the negative thought to say something negative about your own when you see something that may not be to your liking is also fighting white supremacy. Make no mistake about it, in many ways, there are some of us, not y'all, I ain't talking about y'all, Bishop, not your congregation, because I know these are nice, smart people, they come under you. But in some ways, many of us have also, again, not us, not y'all, the people out there, but some folks have also, have also fallen into this notion and belief that all of us are just bad. And unfortunately, some of those people also look like us. So now the question becomes, are you willing to engage with those persons also to help them understand that these systems that were created led to these issues that we may have? But furthermore, our issues are no different from the majority. Dare I say the white folk who also were the first benefactors, benefactors of welfare, the white folk who also have the highest number of crime across the nation, the white folk who also have the lowest level of education across the nation. But furthermore, when you often hear about these data points and statistics, it's based on people who look like the ones talking right now. Having the courage to fight against those ills when they come within your mind is also how we fight white supremacy. Believing the best of ourselves and not always looking to the worst of us or the worst situations in which we may find ourselves in is also how we fight white supremacy. But you see, that takes courage. That takes courage, Bishop. That takes courage to be patient with each other. You know, when we talk about fighting white supremacy, it's not just fighting neo-Nazis with flags and signs that say, West Bellamy, we gonna hang you, you nigger. That's easy. That's easy. I can get 15, 20 of my homies to handle that, in which uh, allegedly that's what some of they did anyway. But, but that's easy. That's easy. That's easy to deal with folks when they got these signs and they want to call you the N-word. That's easy. But doing the hard work, again, of being patient with each other. 
It's the hard work. That's how we change these communities. Daring ourselves to be patient with people, but impatient with progress is how we change our communities. Daring ourselves to read and research so that we understand the true systems in which we are fighting and the true battlefield in which we are on is how we also fight white supremacy. Being willing and daring, and may I say having the courage to lift your brother or your sister up as you go is how we fight white supremacy. You see, my brothers and sisters, it's really easy for us to point out the negative. It's easy for us to notate the things that we see going wrong. Just as easy as it is for us to go and fight back in the comment section of Bishop Swan's IG page when these folks got something crazy to say about this mighty man of God. That's the easy part. There's no one saying that we shouldn't do both. I'm just daring you to do something. There's no one saying that we can't fight on social media as well as in the streets in our community, but I'm just daring you to do something. If Dr. King challenged us to say that nobody else can do this for us, then what are you willing to do? And as I take my seat, I hope you all will join us in this fight. Let's get to work. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I took note. Thank you, Dr. West Bellamy. Another round of applause, please. Dr. Bellamy said we have to be engaged. He asked, what are you willing to sacrifice? And um, I'm a lifelong student, right, and, and learner. So even within my work, I'm learning every day. And so I'm recommitting to five things after listening. And, and I thank you. So my first is to continue to fight systemic racism. My second is to um, move in discomfort. My third is to deal and see my past trauma and use it as lived experience to help heal. My fourth is to meet with legislators. And my fifth is to, I can't read my own writing here, oh, dare to interrupt unequal environments. Thank you, Dr. West, for um, Bellamy, for inspiring um, that movement. All right. So we want to move on to our next section. Director, if we can, just for we can. Um, we're going to call this section sustainable. <laughs> That's why I'm looking at you. I knew it was happening. <laughs> Do it. Okay. Oh man, how much time we got, Bishop? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I firmly believe that strategy is important. And I won't sit here and lie to you and say that I wasn't naive enough to believe that it was gonna be quick because I did. So um there's a, there's a backstory of sorts. I'll try to tell this in, in three minutes, set the clock. I ran for office the first time in 2013. I was uh, 23 years old, had been in Charlottesville for two years, and just thought that I knew everything about everything because I had been in the community, and I said, hey, we ain't got no black folk on council, I'm gonna run. So I had a campaign cookout. Uh, I used to run a boxing club for kids. So I had a campaign cookout at this particular park. And usually, like I, I throw cookouts, barbecues, so on and so forth. And um, we would have like 200 people at all the cookouts. This particular day, we only had about 50. And it was across the street from a homeless shelter. So most of the people who were there were homeless. So I'm thinking to myself, where is everybody at? This is a couple days from the, before the election. It was a Saturday. It was June 8th. The election was June 11th. And um, only about 50, 75 people show up. I go to church the next day, remind everybody, make sure you come out to vote. And there was an elder who pulled me to the side and said, how are you going to represent us after what you did yesterday. 
And I said, I don't really know what happened yesterday. And she walked off. Go to another church. Some of the elders also kind of pulling me to the side. Like, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> so I asked my pastor, tell me what, what everybody's talking about. Like, why is everybody acting like this? And he said, well, did you notice something at the park yesterday? And I said, no, sir. He said, you didn't notice anything in the middle of the park? I said, yeah, this big gray thing. I, it was a statue. He said, what did you think the statue was? I, I don't know. It was a man on a horse. So he said, you know, Wes, you can't represent us without understanding what truly has happened here. So we had a meeting, and there were some, some folks who said, they explained to me how they couldn't walk in that park. People had been spat on in that park. People had had their faces slashed in that park. And there was a state law at the time that didn't allow for statues to be removed. So I knew there wasn't anything that I could do, but I, but I vowed and prayed about it and vowed that if there was ever the opportunity to do something, I would do something. So I lost that election by four votes. God just said it wasn't my time. So there was a tie at the polls, a tie. And there were four votes that weren't count, four ballots that weren't counted at this particular precinct that all went to my opponent. But God had told me it wasn't my time. I was clear as day. I was taking a shower right before going to the, uh, the campaign when they announced the results. And it, it was clear as day. It's not your time. So, okay. I was okay with the results. The next two years, we spent building coalitions and whatnot. So me and our governor became really cool. And our governor said to me, McAuliffe, he said, yo, uh, I wound up winning the next election. We have elections every two years, but they're four-year terms. So I won the next election. I got the most votes in history. I won all 10 precincts. I was a little bit better. I knew what to do. So uh, our governor says, well, Wes, what is that you want to do? And I said, yo, you know what? One thing I want to do is get these statues removed. And he said, yo, do you realize what you, you know, like what you're asking? So in my naivety, I'm like, yeah, well, bro, I just got, like, I just won all 10 precincts, the first person ever. I got more votes than anybody ever. I'm pretty sure they'll go with me. Like, let's do it. And he's saying, no, no, no. I don't think you understand, what, like, what you're asking. So I'm like, all right, man, you just this old white dude. You, don't, you know what I'm saying? You, you don't live here, bro. You live in Richmond. You don't get it. So he calls me in March, and he says, uh, this was, that was in January. He calls me in March, and he says, hey, you, um, you said you want to move those statues, right? And I was like, yeah, yes, sir. He said, all right, make sure you watch the news tomorrow. I got something for you. So I say, okay, I ain't think nothing of it. This young lady named Zayana Bryant calls me the next day, and she says, hey, Wes, did you see the news? Now, Zayana and I have been talking about this for some time. She was 14, a ninth grader at the time, and she wrote a petition at her school to have, like, one thing that she really wanted in the community was these Confederate statues gone. So she said, Wes, did you see the news? So I'm thinking, nah, not yet, and it ain't ringing to me. I said, all right, I'm going to call you back. And I look, and Governor McAuliffe had vetoed a state bill that essentially said that if you want to be able to move statues, it's up to localities. So I'm like, all right, that's what he's talking about. So, yeah, so he calls me that night, and he said, yo, did you see the news? So I said, yes, sir. He said, all right, here you go. This is your time, but I want you to be sure. This is what you want to do. You're sure. So I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you understand, like, what's going to happen? And I said to him, like, you know, I'm, I'm six foot, I'm 220, I'm in great shape, I'm not worried about nobody. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about nobody doing, I, I'm fine, I promise, I'm fine. I live in a neighborhood where it, I'm fine. But I wasn't understanding the totality of what all came with it. So when you ask what moves that you make, I went to, I had a colleague, Kristen Sekos, who is a, this, 65 middle 65 year old white woman from Mississippi her family went to Tougaloo her family taught at Tougaloo which is an HBCU down in Mississippi she had actually uh three years prior got rid of Lee Jackson holiday and she mentioned there'd be a time in which these statues were going to be gone and she received all kind of hate mail hate mail this was my road dog like this this my this my person she with me so I go to her and I say hey I talked to McAuliffe I don't know if you saw the news he said we can move the statue so she like bet Let's go. But she said, Wes, you're black. And I said, I know. And she said, you know, I want you to know what they did to me. And I'm a white woman a couple years back for removing this holiday. You're going to get it 20 times worse. And they're going to put it all on you, even if we come out and do it together. So I said, you know, she's like, you can handle that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's fine. We'll be good. And she's like, I just want you to understand because I love you. You got little kids. Like, I want you to understand this. 
there's only five people on the council. So I say to her, it's no big deal. We only need one more vote. You only need three. So I go to my mayor because I'm the vice mayor. Now I got the most votes, but I turned down the mayorship. I declined the mayorship. So in, in our city, the council appoints their own mayor and vice mayor. It's not elected. So I turned down the mayorship because I was finishing up my PhD. So I said to him, he's proclaimed to be this very progressive guy, so on and so forth. Yo, bro, here we go. I know you with it. Let's get these statues out the way. Me and Kristen with it. You be the third vote. And surprisingly, he was like, uh, I don't know about that. Like, I don't know. And I'm like, yo, I, I don't I don't get this, man. What you talking about? You don't know. Bro, you be always saying you with us. Black Lives Matter. You with LGBTQ. What you mean? Black folk don't like these statues. This is easy. He's like, ah, oh, I don't, I don't know. Let's let's wait. We need a commission. I say, okay. It's two more counselors. We ain't got to stick with him. Let's go talk to some other folk. So there was another friend of mine who was on council, Kathy Galvin. She's an architect, Catholic. Uh, I consider her to be very fair, and a person who, you know, she would come to public housing and I'm with Wes. Let's, you know, let's do stuff. Blah blah blah. <laughs> Hey, Kathy, what's up? Let's get these statues out of here. Oh, I don't know about that, Wes. I don't. Oh, wow. There's such pieces of art, and I'm an architect, and I don't want to make people mad, and like, I, I don't know. Oh, wow. So I'm sitting here like, what the hell? Like, what? <laughs> what? So the person who had beat me two years prior was on council, and he and I had become really cool. He helped me with some community stuff and so forth. He was much older than me. He was like 70 years old at the time. I was like 28. But we were really cool. So I go to him and I say, hey, Bob, Bob Finley, hey man, what's up? We we gotta we gotta get these statues out. He said, Well, Wes, I'm a military veteran. And Robert E. Lee was one of the finest generals in history. I mean, when I was in the army, we learned about his strategy. I don't know about taking his statue down. So I go from all this enthusiasm, because I know we got the votes, to now being stuck with, man, we only got two. So I said, okay, we're going to go to the churches. I'm going to the pastors. I'm going to everybody. Yo, what's up? We, we got to get these statues going. And some of them was like, oh, I don't know, Wes. Like, I don't, like, they'll kill you about this stuff. I'm going, I was, telling, I was talking about this a little bit in the message, but I was walking to this church, and there was a mentor of mine who I love. I absolutely adored this man. And I'm walking up the steps, steps just like y'all. And he said, hey, Wes, what you doing over here? Um, is something special going on? Because I went to the church across the street. But I would go to, like, all the churches. He said, something special going on? And I said, nah, I'm talking to y'all because we're going to have a press conference on Tuesday um, about moving the statues. And he was like, what? I was like, why would you do that? He was like, don't, don't do that. Like, all these people love you. You've been doing good work. Leave them statues alone, man. I've been here my whole life. They're never going never gonna to move. And I wanted to cry. Like when he said that to me, I had to pretend I laughed it off like, <laughs> all right, man, well, we're going to see. But I wanted to cry when I went inside because I couldn't believe he said that to me. But what I later came to realize and understand was that there were a lot of folk within our community who were just afraid. And they had very serious um, situations that occurred in the past with white folk terrorizing them. So they had trauma. So they, as a matter of protection, they didn't want the person who they saw as kind of the young guy who's helping a lot and doing a lot of stuff to be hurt. Yeah. So their, their way of them thinking they were protecting me was to say, don't do it. Long story short, we, uh, long story long, <laughs> we, we said we're going to keep going, right? And we had a press conference in which uh, I told some folks, make sure y'all be there. The governor calls. Me, my friends and I, we play basketball and work out at 6 in the morning. That's just like what we do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The press conference on Tuesday at 9. The, the governor says, this is Monday, hey, the press conference is tomorrow. I'm sending the state troopers to your house, and they're going to go with you everywhere tomorrow. So I'm like, you tripping. Like, you, like you really ODing because, like, yo, it's not like that. You don't get it. And the governor and I, I mean, like, I know I'm just saying, throwing it out like the governor, but this is my man. We cool. And I'm telling him, like, you ODing, like, Nobody needs all of that. And you're going to make me look crazy like going to the gym with state troopers. Like, chill. And he's like, no, they're going with you because you don't understand. So we go to the gym, work out. State troopers are there, which, you know, it's awkward. 
Um, so we're leaving. I'm playing Jeezy. I'm chilling, pulling up to the park. And as I pull up to the park, I see about 50 Confederate flags being waved. And there's probably about 200 people all surrounding this statue. About 30 people on my side and about 200 people on the other side. And that's when I'm like, oh, okay. This is what they're talking about. So when we get there, I give my talk and we have a series of speakers. And they, you know, at first they were cordial, but then they, they turned up a little bit. So my friends turned up and I'm like, all right, it's real. It subsequently gets blast everywhere. We're trying to move these statues. The turning point was the fight, and there was a bunch of stuff that happened in between. They tried to like attack me, my job, make up all this stuff. It, it was crazy. But the next year, in 2017, they had a tiki torch rally on Mother's Day around the statue. And it was very blatant in terms of what they were trying to preserve. I told my colleagues at, on council at that point, if y'all can't get with voting to move these statues now, then you never will. So one of my colleagues, the one who actually beat me, decided to flip his vote. And he said, you know what, Wes, if you can get these other measures passed, there was a budget I wrote called the equity package, which was four and a half million dollars in resources. So it was $50,000 for anybody who lives in public housing to go and get their GED training, $50,000 to go to the local community college for free, $2.5 million for public housing redevelopment. It was a bunch of stuff that I wrote. So he said, if you can get them to vote for that, then I'll vote to move the statues. I told my colleagues, so this is a this strategy. I'm not gonna say I tricked them, but it was strategy. I told my other colleagues, well, look, if y'all don't wanna vote to move the statues, then the least you can do is vote for these substantive issues that you say we need instead of moving these statues. So they voted for that unanimously. Then the next day, my colleague changed his vote, and then we had three votes to be able to move the statues. We got sued. After that, that's when the Tiki Torch rally comes. My one year wedding anniversary, the Klan called and they said, this is gonna be a wedding anniversary you'll never forget. So they did a Klan rally on my one year wedding anniversary. So a bunch of people showed up to counter protest. So the city's on edge. And then the following month is when we had the white supremacist rallies that a lot of folks saw on TV. When Heather Heyer was killed um, and we had all of this, this other stuff, it was at that point my colleagues all decided to change their votes to go 5-0. So I wasn't on council because I only did one term. I decided not to run for a second term. It was just time for me to go do something else. So you know how Moses didn't go to see his people through? I wasn't on council when the statues came down, but God had already told me that wasn't my job to be there. My job was to get them removed. So we talk about sacrifice, like we go through things, but I want y'all to think about it's not always for you to get the quote unquote glory and see something through. Your job may just be to get it started. That's it, just get it started. So you have to believe in your vision enough to just do what you supposed to do. Not what anybody else says, not when people tell you this ain't gonna happen, not when people try to harm you or whatever. You remain steadfast for what you've been told to do, your mission your purpose, and that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So we do have to finish the narrative to what we are doing and what we can do. Yes, ma'am. No problem. I, I challenge my um my students and, and persons who we meet when we have these kind of discussions to never speak in generalizations. Because you can't speak for every black person. You can't speak for what we aren't doing and what's not going on because you don't know every single one of us to understand what it is we may be doing behind the scenes or even in your congregation like this one, or out in the community in the things in which people don't see or talk about. 
So that negative language of what we can't do or what we ain't doing or what isn't happening is a byproduct of white supremacy. But that's why we have to be bold and courageous enough to challenge when those notions come about to say, in fact, we are doing A, B, and C. Now, the other part of that is just trauma. Those are trauma responses. When you don't see the progression in the way in which you believe it should be, it's very easy to believe that these things aren't happening. But we have to have the endurance Amen. to continue to fight. We have to have the endurance to continue to show up and the endurance plus the research to speak on what is happening. That's why engagement is so important because when you're engaged, then you can talk about some of the victories. Doesn't mean that everything is solved, doesn't mean that all things will be easy, but we can talk about the progression in which we made in some regard, but we also can tout why it's so important for us to continue to fight. Okay, I th think we got time for one more, Bishop said, or he gonna kick us out? <laughs> Okay. Um, so, uh, they kind of describe mm. you. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh -huh. you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I'm, a, I'm a white guy, but uh -huh. I'm part of this community. You know, yeah. I grew up in Springfield. I live here. Yeah. Here, and, and I have so many people in this room I count as my friends, my family. Uh huh. Um, what can all the white dudes? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and, and Bishop, uh, so I bought y'all a, ser a series of books, but all my luggage is at the airport. So in, the, in my book, uh, When White Supremacy Knocks, Fight Back, How White People Use Their Privilege, How Black People Use Their Power, there's a list of different things in which we can do. But the first thing I, I believe that you can do, and that, again, it's a phenomenal question, is be present and decide to be intentional about being an ally. So how do we be an ally and how do we be an accomplice is something that only you can determine. But I think you have to ask yourself again, one, what are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to get out of your comfort level? As you just did, speaking up in spaces like this, but also showing up is of the utmost importance. But when we say to white people, our white colleagues, our, our white brothers and sisters, are you willing to challenge that grandmother or aunt to your uncle or that cousin or classmate when they say those words that we know are not becoming of who we want to be, are you willing to be uncomfortable in that matter to say, hey, man, that ain't cool? Are you, are you willing to challenge in that regard? Are you willing to use your privilege to say that we see these atrocities happening? We see these, this lack of budget allocation being made to communities in which we know have been underrepresented and underserved. That's how, those are part of the ways in which we use, you, know, you use your skin as your privilege, you become an ally and accomplice, but, but again, man, it's a question, it's an individual decision that you have to make. Similar to our folk, the book says how white people use their privilege, but also how black folk use their power, and understand that we have power. Power in the tongue with the words in which we use, power in our ability to organize and galvanize, power in our ability to mobilize, and then what happens when we all work together to bring forth tangible change for that young lady behind us. You know, it's one thing to have the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame here, but it's another thing for us to have equity within our budgets for our communities. That's where we collectively work together. That's our power and that's our privilege. So that would be my answer to your question, brother, and I would just encourage you to keep fighting. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. I did something wrong. I didn't bring a notebook, and these are all the notes I'm taking. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known you're an educator. All right. Dr. West Bellamy said um, that he learned uh, the significance of the statue and that he did not leave alone, alone. I'm quoting you to yourself. Right, um, which reminds me that our history, our culture, and our identity is extremely important when we think about dismantling. And I know that I've had many conversations with uh, First Lady Swan, and we've talked about uh, anti-blackness, right, and how important that is, and how things are different for me as a brown sister, uh, Puerto Rican brown sister that also identifies as an Afro-Puerto Rican. So thank you for reminding us uh, the importance of, of getting to work and moving into action 
uh, when you realize uh, that uh, something is uh, new to you. Now we go to the next part of the program. Yes, all right. I'm asking for permission. I introduce. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. All right. So uh, lift every voice. Uh, this year's theme uh, very much aligned with everything that our keynote has said, learning from the past and looking toward uh, the future. And every year, in addition to enjoying the performances, the music, the spoken word, and our keynote speaker, we get to honor uh, a community member uh, with the Community Award for Lift Every Voice. I will read a little bit of the bio, then pass it over to uh, Bishop Swan. And you can make your way to the stage, sister, Vanessa Ford. You can give a round of applause for that. <laughs> sister Vanessa Ford is, um, she began singing in the church choir at the age of seven, and she loves every genre of music. She is an aficionado of classic music, jazz, pop, traditional, uh, contemporary gospel music, and she's performed the national anthem in so many spaces, not only throughout our community, but throughout our state. She currently serves as a public ma project manager for Trust Transfer, a collaboration with the Community Music School of Springfield and the Springfield Cultural Partnership. The Trust, Trust Transfer Project engages a board representation of young creatives and working artists from Springfield to develop artistic messaging in a variety of volumes to dismantle um, uh, inequities across the city. The Trust Transfer Project centers the creative voices of black, indigenous, and people of color from Springfield with the goal of improving the health and well-being of our community. Vanessa has led many organizations like uh, the Girls Club Family Center, Director of Praise and Worship in the St. John's Congregational Church. She has taught for more than 20 years music in most motion to fourth graders, co-founder of the Women of Faith Ensemble. She's a board member of Blues to Green, uh, participates in the annual Jazz and Roots Festival. She's a committee member of the Brianna Fund for Children uh, with Physical Disabilities. Uh, she has written two songs, right? Stronger Together, which was released in 2016, and Fight For You in January 2021. She is a sister um, in the work, uh, who I have the honor to introduce, and she strives to use her gifts to touch the hearts of many, and to hope, um, in hopes that the difference in the lives of others throughout her life um, can be seen through her community service and music. Bishop Swan to introduce Sister Vanessa Ford. All right. Our award recipient that we're honoring tonight, Ms. Vanessa Ford. Um, if you were here last week, you would have heard her sing. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I opened up the fellowship conference for Pastor Burgess last night, and she sang before I preached. She, ma she makes preaching much easier. <laughs> Um, but um, everything that Waleska read about her, but she is a, uh, a, a darling, a, um, uh, a gift to our community in so many ways, not just in terms of her musical talent, uh, but her other gifts and abilities and how she gives back uh, to the community in so many ways. And so we're honored to be able to, um, to recognize her on tonight. Uh, Spring of Hope Church Lift Every Voice Community Service Award presented to Ms. Vanessa Ford for outstanding leadership and community service, February 23rd, 2023, Bishop Talbert Swan, the second senior pastor. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You're beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, Ed wants to take a picture. Oh my God. <laughs> Ed's always going to direct the picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised. I'm thankful to be here this evening to just um, 
give glory and honor to God, who is the head of my life and the guider of my heart and my strength and my redeemer. I am so happy to be in the house one more time. Um, thank you to Bishop Swan. Thank you so much. Um, to my sister, First, First Lady Cynthia, you know I love you. Uh, to my sister also, Aleska, God bless you. To Dr. Bellamy, you gave a mighty word. Thank you so much. To everybody who's here and everybody watching, I just want to encourage you to continue to find your purpose, to find your gift. This award reminds me of, gosh, probably when I was 12, 13 years old. I, I really wasn't sure what my calling was. But my father was very clear when he told me that my gift and my anointing was going to bless others. I didn't know if that would manifest in my voice or if it would manifest in work, community service, um, and service to others in general who were in need. In my voice, um, I pray to God every day that he allows me the opportunity to use my voice to help the vulnerable and to find ways to bring light into dark places. It's not always easy. Um, I find life um, puts us in particular situations and challenges that we might be able to use the power that God has given us to rise above it, the challenge and to also bring others with us. So this is not just for me, um, but it's for you. And <laughs> I find it hard to receive a, you know, outstanding leadership because I'm always looking for um, others, especially young people, to lead me into places where I need to be the most. Um, I ask for a spirit of discernment um, from God to, to guide me into places where I can help others, especially to help other artists who are striving uh, to use their gifts in appropriate and needed places. Um, I find it amazing that God has put me in this work after since the pandemic mm -hmm. to, to kind of help others to reimagine their purpose and to realign their gifts in the community mm -hmm. and to really serve others. Because when we're, we're, when we're in the midst of our challenges, we can use our gifts and our talents and our anointing to help lift us up together and bring us out of our our, our challenges and so um, the work that I'm doing now in, in bridging the gap between public health and the arts and culture organizations we're proving that artists have a place in society yeah. and that we don't have to um, be ashamed of asking for compensation mm -hmm. we don't have to be ashamed of our gift and that our gifts have power to change and transform lives mm -hmm. and so I'm thankful for this um, not because I feel like I deserve an award, but, I, but I'm gonna use it as a reminder. Whenever I feel challenged, or when I feel defeated, because I have my goals and I trust the Lord. And anytime my expectations don't work out, thank you sir exactly the way I planned, I always know that God has the final say. And he is the author and finisher of my faith. And I know that I stand here in this season after so many years of believing in my, in my future, I now stand here to believe in yours. So whatever your purpose is, Whatever you've always dreamed you wanted to be, it's never too late. I don't care how young you are. You're sitting in the back. I see you. I see you. No matter how old you are, if you have a dream, it's not too late. As long as God gives us breath in our body, our purpose is to help each other, to serve each other, to raise each other up, to lift each other up, and to never give up. So I lift my voice for me. I lift my voice for my ancestors. I lift my voice for my parents, for my daughter, for my two grandsons who are eight and 10, who are striving to be young kings every day in the midst of all of their challenges. 
So I'm encouraged by the young people when I see them, and I'm encouraged by my elders equally. I'm thankful for our spiritual leadership and people like Talbert, Bishop Talbert Swan continue to have courage because we're with you, we're watching you, we're supporting you, praying for you and your family. And I know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all, we ask or think. God bless you. Amen. All right, one more time for Vanessa Ford. One more time for Dr. Bellamy. You know, God has a special anointing in people who are named Wesley. <laughs> in case y'all didn't know, my name is Talbert Wesley Swan. <laughs> my son is Talbert Wesley III. <laughs> so there's a special anointing in Wesley. You know, the, the, the Protestant church kicked off because of a fella named Wesley. But I, we ain't not going to get into all that. Uh, listen, um, March 9th, the March 9th, let's see, who do we have? We have the Reverend J.P. Morgan um, Jr. who will be singing for us. Thank you. Um, we have... Uh, uh, Diane McCauley, who will be dancing for us. Uh, we have Brother Aaron St. Louis, who will be giving us the spoken word. And we have Teslin Figaro, who will be speaking to us on March 9th. So uh, let's get ready. Let's get ready. <laughs> Matter of fact, Doc, she asked me to make sure the organist is here. Because she, she says she wants to, the first time she preached, she want to be here. She wants the chords to come behind her. <laughs> so so we're going we're gonna to make sure Brother Arnold and the musicians are here so we can just have some church on that night. So uh, let's get ready for March 9th. Yeah, we had church tonight. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. All right, we're ready to go? All right, let's stand. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, Youthful Expressions. Thank you, T. Swan. Thank you. How about a round of applause for Waleska Lugo de Jesus? And thank you, Dr. Bellamy. Now, Lord, as we leave this place, dismiss us not from thine presence, but go with us to our several homes, destinations, places of rest. Suffer no hurt, harm, or danger to come upon us, no evil to befall us, and bring us back at the time you appointed. Now unto the King eternal, the only wise God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And the people of the Lord said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.